Hey, if you have a Bible this morning, I want to encourage you to open those up to the book of Exodus. So Exodus is the second book in the Bible, so pretty uh, quick and easy to find. So Exodus chapter 1, while you're turning there, uh, I want to kind of share with you an epiphany my wife had this week that kind of gave me a great kind of reset my, my brain and my heart for our series that we started a couple weeks ago, but really in earnest, we'll start today looking at the life of Moses. For some of you, you'll, you'll know a lot of the stories of Moses. For some of you, you'll know pieces, bits and pieces, or have heard the name of Moses before. And this summer is just going to be an incredible, incredible series. I want to encourage you to go on Amazon and purchase the book. You can get that for your Kindle. Uh, or a digital version of that, you can always go on our app. It's All of our publishing is free on our app. Or if you're old school like me and you need a paper book, you can go on Amazon and you can order one of those and have it delivered to your house, I think in 2022 or something. I, who knows what the timeline is of that at the moment. But I uh, want to encourage you to do that. There's so many incredible things that are happening uh, this summer with that series. And then certainly our location pastors, all six of those guys, preaching and teaching through that this summer. You can listen to those sermons throughout the week and really have a rich study in the life of Moses uh, this summer. But the epiphany for me this week was uh, uh, later on in the week, I think it was on Friday, I needed to work on my tractor uh, a little bit. Now, I am not mechanically inclined uh, at all. I, I know enough to know how very much I do not know, how very little I actually am, am competent on. And so I, I had to get a few parts and had to call and, and, and parts place and hey, do you, you know, and so the, the particular filters for the oil filter and the, the hydraulic lines, hydraulic fluid and oil. And so it's just going all these different things. And I just feel so stupid because I'm like, man, I'm, I'm a man. I should know these things and I do not. And my wife said to me, she said, you know, when you feel very anxious and very, um, I don't know if she used the word inept, but it, you know, it, it certainly is an ineptness in my life. You know, when you feel those things about mechanical things and calling and asking questions, you feel kind of stupid and feel kind of lame. She said, that's how a lot of people feel when they open the Bible and you start teaching and you assume that they know a lot of things. And she said it with just such tenderness and such amazing Holy Spirit led insight that I just want to apologize to, to anyone that I've ever made feel lesser than or inadequate or uh, those types of things when it comes to teaching the Bible. There's a lot that I take for granted that I've grown up knowing when it comes to uh, the Bible. And for many of you, you didn't grow up knowing that. Maybe you're new in your walk with Christ. And so even opening the Bible and understanding what is Exodus, what, what does that all mean? I'm so thrilled over the next few months to be walking you and to walk us through uh, God's glory on incredible display here in the book of Exodus and really the life of Moses. So let's pick up in Exodus chapter 1 in verse number 1. The Bible says, These are the names of the sons of Israel who came to Egypt with Jacob. So Jacob and Israel are the same guy. Started out as Jacob, God changed his name to Israel. Each with his household. So his sons are listed there. Reuben, Reuben Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, Zebulon, and Benjamin. Dan, Naphtali, or Gad, and Asher. So they're, they're listed there. And the Bible says all the descendants of Jacob, or Israel, were 70 persons. Joseph, Joseph being another son, from Jacob was already in Egypt. So the Bible here is, is giving kind of a, a quick family tree that will help set up the rest of the book of Exodus. Jacob, Israel, has a bunch of sons, has these 12 sons, and, and they have wives and they have kids, and they travel to the land of Egypt. 70 of them travel there, but Joseph, their brother, was already in Egypt. The reason Joseph was in Egypt is because years earlier, his brothers had sold him into slavery. Joseph was his father's favorite son and caused a lot of strife, a lot of jealousy, even hatred 
with his other brothers, and so they sold him. Then they lied to their dad and said a wild animal came and killed Joseph. And so the father goes into mourning for all of these years. But God used that. God used it because Joseph goes ahead as a slave into Egypt, and God, through just his divine, sovereign grace, takes Joseph from being a slave to second in charge of Egypt. Egypt. Well, the reason that happened was because a famine was coming. And Joseph, it was revealed through a dream to Joseph that this famine was coming in seven years. So Joseph was put in charge of stockpiling all of the food, the grain in Egypt to supply for the seven years of famine that was coming. Well, Egypt was set, but the world around it hadn't prepared. They didn't know that a famine was coming for seven years. And so starvation, and this would be a devastating thing for families. And so Jacob, his family, his 70 people over here have a bunch of money, but they don't have food. So jo Jacob hands his son's money and says, listen, go to Egypt. I know there's grain there. Get some food there. Well, they go. They encounter their brother Joseph, who they long thought dead, gone, slave, didn't have any idea where he was. And this family reunion happens. It's a, a really comical, very sweet story at the end of the book of Genesis. Well, Joseph's in a position of power. He's in a position of providing for his father and for his brothers and for their wives and for their kids. And so he invites them to Egypt. So 70 people leave the land of Canaan, what's known as the promised land, and they come to Egypt and they settle in there. And it is just awesome. They have land, they have land for their animals, they have food, uh, the, the strife, the concern about starvation years or, you know, earlier is over. They now are there, and Joseph, their brother, is high up in the Egyptian government. They are all set. Verse 6, then Joseph died. He gets old. Time passes on. Joseph dies, and all his brothers and all that generation dies. But the people, so the descendants further on, Joseph, his brothers, their, their kids and their kids' kids, were fruitful and increased greatly. They multiplied, grew exceedingly strong, so that the land was filled with them. So the, the family, if you will, the last name of Israel, the nation of Israel, the Hebrew people, really start to, to uh, populate. They, they start to, their families are growing. Their kids are having lots of kids. Their kids' kids are having lots of kids. And so they're really spreading out. They're increasing greatly. And the land of Egypt is filled with them. Verse 8. Now there arose a new king over Egypt, who did not know Joseph. So this new Pharaoh, this new king goes to power in Egypt and he's not aware of Joseph. He's not aware that Joseph was a Hebrew and Joseph was almost single-handedly used by God to save the Egyptian nation. He doesn't know any of that. What he starts to do is he starts to look around and take an assessment of his kingdom, verse nine. And he says to his people, behold, the people of Israel are too many and too mighty for us. So he starts to just essentially take a census, look around, and he's like, wait a minute, there are a lot of Hebrews. There are a lot of descendants from the people of Israel. We, we, got, a prob we got a potential massive problem here. They, they are mighty for us. Verse 10, come, let us deal shrewdly with them, lest they multiply and if war breaks out, they join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. So this king rises and he sees the, the, the people of Israel multiplying and, and, and exceeding and, and, and their flocks are growing and they are, they are multiplying and they are successful. They're increasing, they're filling the land. Things are going really well for them. And the Egyptians like, I, this, this is a problem. These aren't natives. These, these aren't people that are Egyptian. If another military comes in, comes to the leaders of Israel and says, hey, we'll pay you, we'll free you, we want to partner up with you and fight against Egyptian uh, kings and the Egyptian country, well, that would go really bad. So the king of Egypt decides, let's deal with them shrewdly. Let's, let's change the paradigm here. Let's, let's shift things around. Verse 11. So with, with that motive, seeing the, the children of Israel 
growing and, and multiplying. Therefore, verse 11, they set taskmasters over them to afflict them with heavy burdens. They built for Pharaoh store cities. So think about that, just building cities. Python, Ramesses. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied, and the more they spread abroad. Pharaoh thought if we oppress them, if we, if we really enslave them and make them build these cities and set taskmasters over them, then, then the population will decrease. Well, the problem is the population continued to increase. It increased even more. So the more the oppression happened, the more they multiplied, the more they spread out. So the Egyptians, verse 12, the Egyptians were in dread of the people of Israel. It's almost like the population, you can kind of see it being hinted at here, the population of Hebrews is larger than the population of, of Egyptians in the nation of Egypt. So it's like this disparity can't uh, continue. The Egyptians start to see the Hebrews and they're populating, they're, they're multiplying, they're filling the land, they're successful, their flocks, their herds are, are growing. And it's like, this is not good. Their, their businesses maybe are under threat, start to feel some dread. So verse 13, so they ruthlessly made the people of Israel, or so they ruthlessly made the people of Israel work as slaves and made their lives bitter with hard service in mortar and brick and all kinds of work in the field. In their work, they ruthlessly made them work as slaves. I did a summer, just a summer, working in uh, the construction industry, uh, pouring basement walls. Super hard work. I think I would die if I attempted to do it uh, today. Man, I was just an 18-year-old punk who could survive and do that. The labor here is super grueling, super hard. It is ruthless, verse 13, ruthless. And they're, they're making the lives of Israel bitter. But the more they oppressed them, the more they continued to grow. So they needed to go a step further, verse 15. Then the king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, one of whom was named Shifra, the other Pua, when you serve as midwives to the Hebrew women and see them on the birth stool, if it is a son, you shall kill him. But if it is a daughter, she shall live. But the midwives feared God and did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but let the male children live. So the king of Egypt called the midwives and said to him, why have you done this? And let the male children live. The midwives said to Pharaoh, because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, for they are vigorous and give birth before the midwife comes to them. They, they tell a lie here, which again has a whole moral dilemma there. We could spend a lot of time on, which we won't. Verse 20, so God dealt well with the midwives. And the people multiplied and grew very strong. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families. So look at verse 22. Then commanded Pharaoh, right? Then Pharaoh commanded all his people. Every son that is born to the Hebrews, you shall cast into the Nile, but you shall let every daughter live. This ramps up from a, a, a uh, kind of a, a racism and underlying racism seeing people to being just a dread, dreading seeing people. Then it's like we're going to enslave those people. Now we're not just going to enslave them. We're going to inflict population control on them and try to kill their newborn sons as they're born so that those boys don't grow up to be great warriors. When that didn't work, it's like, it, this is all out. Let's, let's, let's pull back the curtain. Let's pull back any pretense of courtesy or kindness. You see a Hebrew baby boy. You go yank that boy from his parent's arm and go throw him in the Nile, feed him to the crocodiles, or let him drown. It's like, what? Like just the ruthlessness of how things escalate in Exodus chapter 1 to an incredible amount of trials is really crazy. And it didn't start that way. It started out really in Exodus 1. The, the, it's laid out there. Joseph's there. 70 people are there. Everything is wonderful. Man, and everything turns. Everything turns. And it becomes a place of incredible trial, a place of incredible cruelty, difficulty, uh, it, it made the life, the Bible says there, they made the lives of the Israelites bitter. Bitter. They sought to do this. And when they couldn't succeed in keeping 
the population growth down through that slavery. They just resorted to murder and then they sought just some large scale genocide. Uh, if you're a student of history at all, it's hard not to see what the Nazis did in Germany and throughout much of Europe to the Jews in the 30s and 40s. It's, it's hard not to see the parallels there. They're, they're unbelievable connecting uh, all of those dots. But they were placed in extraordinary trial. And you think, man, that's, that's really sad. Oh, man, that's a, it's a bummer they had to be in that position. But the Bible, Genesis, leading up to Exodus, has a lot to teach us about God's purposes in trials. The, the Israel, the nation of Israel, the people of God here, find themselves in an extraordinary trial, a, a gut-wrenching, awful, life-threatening trial. But it's interesting when you look back just a few to a few occasions in the book of Genesis, how God had told them what he was going to do. Hold your spot in Exodus chapter 1 and go back into the book of Genesis to Genesis chapter 15. Genesis chapter 15, and that's relatively early in the book of Genesis. There's about 50 chapters in, in the book of Genesis. Genesis 15 uh, picks up in the story of a man named Abraham, or at that point his name was Abram. God would later change his name to Abraham. And so God comes to him. This is Genesis chapter 15 and verse number 12. And I want you to keep in mind that this is about 500 plus years before, 500 plus years before Moses would come on the scene, before Moses would be born. And the story that we know is the exodus or exiting from Egypt would unfold. This is what the Bible says, Genesis 15, 12. As the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and behold, a dreadful and great darkness fell upon him. Then the Lord said to Abraham, know for certain. God says, I want you to know this for certain. This isn't a vague possibility. Know for certain that your offspring, your descendants, your kids, 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 right? Your offspring will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs. They're going to be immigrants. They're going to be sojourners. They're going to be exiled into a land that isn't theirs and will be servants there, slaves there. And they will be afflicted for 400 years. But I will bring judgment, God says, on the nation that they serve and afterward they shall come out with great possessions. Great possessions. What's the Bible telling us Hundreds of years before the children of Israel would go, would, would the, the story of the Exodus would unfold. God says, you're going to go. Know for certain, Abraham, your kids are going to go to Egypt and they're going to be enslaved there. But I'm going to bring my judgment upon them and then bring them out of that nation. Well, Abraham had a son named Isaac. Isaac had a son named Jacob. And Jacob would be the one to take the 70 people, his 70 descendants, including himself, into Egypt. And there they are now, centuries later, facing extraordinary, extraordinary trials. That passage there in Genesis 15 teaches us God's purposes in trial. That it's oftentimes God's will for us to face trials. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and you don't have to turn there. You can just kind of jot it down, but I would encourage you to look at it in a little bit. Or you can turn there right now if you want. It's totally up to you. 1 Thessalonians, it's a... A book in the New Testament. It's a letter written by the Apostle Paul to a church at the city of Thessalonica. He actually writes them two, two letters that we have, 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians. And really from those letters, we can see that this is a church, this is a group of people that really endured a lot of trials, a lot of persecution, a lot of poverty. Uh, their, their expectation for anything good was the return of Christ. And so Paul talks often to them about that. But he says this at the end of 1 Thessalonians in chapter 5 and verse 16. He says, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks 
in all circumstances, for this is the will of God. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in uh, will of God in Christ Jesus for you. God had told Abraham years and years earlier, this is what I'm going to do. And God's plan was unfolding. In suffering, we know that God, it is God's will that we go through trials, that we go through testing, that we go through periods of suffering. We say, well, well why? That seems cruel. That seems harsh. It does seem at times for me and for you, maybe unloving from God that difficulties happen uh, in our life. But we have to remember that that's God's will and God is doing something. God is doing something. Look at Genesis chapter 46. Genesis chapter 46. Uh, Jacob has learned that Joseph, his beloved son, his favorite son, is alive. The brothers are like, hey, he's alive. He's, he's welcoming us to Egypt, all of these different things. And so God speaks to him. This is Genesis 46, 2. God spoke to Israel in the visions of the night and said, Jacob, Jacob. And he said, Jacob responds, here am I. Then he said, God said, I am God, the God of your fathers. So his fathers, right? Isaac, Abraham. So Abraham, Isaac, Jacob is how, often how God is introduced. Do not be afraid, God says to him, to go down to Egypt for there I will make you into a great nation. I want you to see that. Jacob is in the promised land. He's in the land of Canaan, a land that God had promised to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, and eventually Moses would help lead the children of Israel right up to the edge of it. Then the leader Joshua would come in and lead them into the promised land, the land promised to them from God. Jacob's nervous to leave the promised land in the middle of this famine because that's where his that, that's what his father told him was promised him. That's what his grandfather told him was promised him. God says, don't be afraid. Leave, leave there. Go to Egypt because it's in Egypt. I'm going to turn you into a great nation. God says this, I myself will go down with you to Egypt and I will bring you up again and Joseph's hands shall close your eyes. You're, you're going to go there. You're going to die there. Joseph's going to be there when you pass away. But it's in Egypt that I'm going to make you a great nation. You see that all throughout Exodus. I know it's, 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 it's tons of trials are going on, but look back at Exodus chapter one in verse number seven. But the people of Israel were fruitful and increased greatly. They multiplied and grew greatly strong or exceedingly strong so that the land was filled with them. They go from being 70 people and now the multiplication is happening. Verse number 12, the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied, the more they spread abroad. Verse number 20, God dealt well with the midwives. The people multiplied and grew very strong. What's happening is exactly what God said would happen. I'm going to send you to Egypt. It was God's will, and that was revealed to Abraham. Jacob is told by God, go to Egypt. Don't be afraid to go to Egypt because it is there that I'm going to make you a great nation. It's there that I'm going to fulfill that promise that I gave to Abraham centuries earlier. I didn't share this at nine, and, and I, it's not in my notes, but I think it's just so cool when you see all of this unfold. In Genesis 12, when the first encounter with God and Abraham happens, this is what the Bible says. The Lord said to Abraham, this is Genesis 12, 1, go from your country, your kindred, your father's house to the land that I will show you. That's the promised land. I will make you a great nation. I'm going to make you a great nation. Well, how did that happen? When Jacob shows up in Egypt, he's 70 people, and God says, this is where I'm going to do it. This is where I'm going to make you a great nation, and he's going to do so in the middle of trials. It was God's will for them to face trials, but it was also God was doing something great with them in the middle of the trials, in the middle of the trials. Book of James chapter 1 Scripture says this, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. Now, we all face trials of various kinds. Some 
are facing lots of trials at this moment. Some are facing medical trials. Some are facing uh, mental trials, trials of loneliness or trials of depression or trials of anxiety. There's, there's physical trials. There's financial trials. There's uh, relational trials with, with marriage and kids and family and friends. And we all face a variety of trials. The Bible says, count it all joy. Well, I'll be honest with you. I read that and I go, I don't, I don't know how to do that. Why would the Bible tell me to count it all joy during trials? Well, it gives the answer. Verse two, count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness and let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Well, the book of Hebrews, or excuse me, the book of Romans says the same thing, right? Romans chapter five says this in verse number three, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. Well, how do those things happen? How, are, how is steadfastness, how is character produced? How is endurance built? It's built through suffering. It's built through trials of various kinds. God tells Abraham, it's my will that they go there. I'm going to make you a great nation. Abraham didn't know that it was going to be in Egypt that they would be made a great nation. God says to Jacob, Abraham's grandson, go to Egypt. Don't be afraid to go there because it's there that I'm going to make you a great nation. The afflictions happened. As the affliction rose, so did the size and the success of their nation. God was fulfilling it in trials. I don't know what trial you're going through, but there is a purpose from God in that trial. God is doing something in your life and we are to rejoice in our suffering. We are to uh, count it all joy, as James says, as we meet trials of various kinds because we know that that trial is producing in us something, listen, that wouldn't be there otherwise. It wouldn't be there. If you ever come into my house, you come in the front door, and just to the left, you'll see our living room there, and we have these maple beams there, these maple 10 by 10 beams lag bolted into uh, the, you know, the framing of the house, and there's this, there's this maple beam across the, the ceiling there, and it has three words etched into it. We, we thought long and hard and, and prayed about it and bantered back and forth. My wife and I did what we wanted to put on the beam there. It's like kind of the first message when people walk in the door. And there's three words there. The, word is, the words are blood, sweat, and tears. Now, I know there was a band before my time, and I'm not a fan, not really. But, so that's not why that's there. But it's there because um, in our house is blood, sweat, and tears. I mean, there's, there's blood on the floor from where I fell through the floor, you know, gutting it and remodeling it and all those different things. There's a lot of sweat and there are a lot of tears, no, no doubt there. But it's more than that because we realize that anything worth doing in life is gonna cost you blood, sweat, and tears. It's through blood, sweat, and tears that things are produced in us, birthed in us, that wouldn't be there, couldn't be there otherwise. I don't wish trials and difficulties on my kids, blood, sweat, and tears, if you will. But I know that they will never have character. They will never have endurance. They will never have steadfastness in life. They will never have grit in life if they don't go through trials, come out the other side. It's the same spiritually. That's the law of God. Many of us want a steady steadfast relationship with Jesus, but it's going to cost us some blood, sweat, and tears. We're going to go through some trials because it's through those trials that God produces in, us, produces in us that character and that steadfastness. I, I don't say that. I, I was thinking about preaching this and I thought, I do not want to preach this because maybe I'm setting myself up for trials, but I know that there's something on the other side of the trial that I cannot have until I go through that trial. There's, there's a lesson that I cannot learn until I go through that trial and then I will know it on the other side. There's a deep,
deepening and a growing of my faith that I can't have unless I first go through this, this trial, this difficulty, this testing. It's true for you. It's true for all of us. We want to deepen our relationship with Christ. There are some valleys that we must go through. There's some darkness we must face. There's some difficulties we must go through. So we go beyond that. There is a deepening of our relationship. Let me just say a note about marriage. Many people want a good marriage, but they bail out of the trials. My, my wife and I, this year, so a couple months from now, will be married for 18 years. They have not all been great years. Very, very serious trials in our life. Very serious trials in our marriage. Well, I, I wouldn't trade where our marriage is today to escape those trials. It wasn't that those trials were all fantastic and fun and yippee, this is, this is great. But you, you, don't, you don't get the mature, solid, stable marriage without going through trials. Now, now I would say this, like we're, we're still only been married for 18 years. That's still a drop in the bucket. I hope we got 30 or 40 or 50 more to go. That'd be wonderful. But we don't, we don't get to the stable marriage that we long for if we hit the escape button, if we, if we take the escape hatch um, if we eject out of those problems when we're going through them, many people are like, well, I'll forget it. Let's just get divorced. And it's like, you're, you're missing it. God is, yes, you're facing difficulties, financial difficulties or, or intimacy issues, or you're, you're facing uh, health issues, or you're facing parenting issues, you're facing issues with parents or in-laws or, or sister-in-law or brother-in-law or friends or jobs or whatever. But you're facing those difficulties and you're like, forget it, I'm out, sorry it didn't work out. That, that's uh, irreconcilable differences brought us there. Then the problem is people hit that button and they miss out on the lesson God is trying to teach them. They, they miss out on what God is trying to form them into. Trials, it's the sanctification process. The Bible says in Hebrews, even Jesus learned obedience to his father through what he suffered. So what's it doing? Suffering is producing something in us that we cannot have otherwise. That's true in our life. That's true in our spiritual life. That's true in our marriage. And some of you are thinking about bailing out right now. Don't. Take your eyes off thinking about bailing out. Take, take your eyes off thinking about getting divorced and look and go, okay, what, what is being produced in me? What is being grown in me? What's, what's being uh, made in me by God through this season, this trial? God says to Jacob, you're going to Israel and it's there I'm going to make you a great nation. Well, we just read all of what's happening in Exodus 1, and it's awful trials. It's horrible trials. It's murderous trials that are happening for these people, and yet God's promise is being filled alongside of that. We, we are not the exception to that. Any idea of this, this whole abominable thing called the prosperity gospel, it's from the pit of hell. God is not always into our health, wealth, and prosperity. He's into our holiness. And what he does is, is that suffering goes along and the promises of God run parallel to that. We can't miss those lessons throughout the scripture. Count it all joy. So it was in Egypt that God was going to fulfill his promise to Abraham, Isaac, to Jacob. Back to the book of Exodus. Matter of fact, back to the book of Genesis, the last phrasing, the last few phrases there. At the end of the book of Genesis, Joseph is dying. Joseph is um, 110 years old. And he says this in verse 24. Joseph said to his brothers, I'm about to die, but God will visit you and bring you up out of the land that I swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. And I want you to see this. Then Joseph made the sons of Israel swear, saying, God will surely visit you, and you shall carry up my bones from here. So Joseph died, being 110 years old. This is how the book of Genesis ends, right? Creation, the fall of Adam and Eve, the, the flood, Noah's flood story, Abraham. Uh, Isaac, Jacob, all of these huge, huge stories that we, we could spend, we, we spent last summer, but we could spend 10 years going through it easily. This is how the book of Genesis ends. So Joseph died being 110 years old. They embalmed him and he was put in a coffin in Egypt. 
he was, he died, he got old, he died. They embalmed him and they put him in a coffin. Joseph died a wealthy man. Joseph died a prominent figure in Egypt. But he says, don't leave my body here. I'm longing to go somewhere better. That's what trials do. Trials make us long for heaven. They make us long, and that's our promised land. Joseph says, don't, don't leave my body here. You, you make a covenant, you make a vow with me that when God comes and he visits us and he takes us out of here, you swear to me that you will take my body out of here and bury me in the promised land. Carry me up out of here. He died in this hope that God would send a savior and he would take the people out of Egypt and back to the promised land. Trials are given so we don't become too content here. Job says it this way in Job chapter 23 and verse 10. He speaks, to, speaks about God. He says, he knows the path that I take. When he has tried me, I shall come out as gold. I shall come out as gold. Many people miss that trials are the will of God. Abraham was told it's the will of God. They're going to go and they're going to be afflicted and tried in Egypt for 400 years. It's not going to be a cakewalk. Jacob is told you're going to go there and it's, it's in that place that I'm going to make you a great nation. So it's in trials that God is making something in us. It's the refiner's fire. But Joseph is the lesson there from Joseph in Genesis chapter 50, is trials make us hope for something beyond. They make us hope for something beyond. We look around, many of us live pretty good lives. We do. It's easy for many of us, some of us not, and I understand that, so I'm not trying to uh, be silly. But for many of us, we live um, very blessed lives. And we become content. Content with where we're at. And we don't long for the promised land. Now, I want you to see the, the imagery that the Bible is using there. We live in Egypt. We live in a fallen, broken world filled with trials. That's where we live. And it's into that world, in the world of Exodus, we see it in chapter 2 and verse 1, that a baby is born and his name is Moses. And Moses would become the deliverer. He'd become the savior of the people to, to be used by God to bring them out of Egyptian bondage. We live in Egypt. Now, not the Egypt, the country. We live in Egypt in a broken, fallen world where there's suffering all around us. I mean, that is illustrated, I hope, so clearly during this COVID-19 crisis. There's, there's trials. We live in a broken, fallen world, and we need a Savior. And suffering is good for us because it makes us long for heaven. It makes us long for what Jesus came to offer us. He came just like Moses came into a society where the, the people of God were enslaved. Jesus came in, we were slaves of sin. He went to the cross, he paid the penalty for our sin. He even uses, the scripture does, the slave metaphor where through his work on the cross, he buys us out of slavery and he adopts us into his family. We're no longer slaves to sin. We become slaves of righteousness. We become sons and daughters of the most high king. So his work on the cross frees us from our sin. His resurrection from the dead offers us the hope of of eternal life and that's what we are longing for that's what we're looking for Hebrews chapter 11 I was just thinking about this passage of scripture Hebrews chapter 11 says this of Abraham 
He was a, a sojourner and he, he walked around. It says, by faith, verse 9, he went to live in the land of promise as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to a city that has a foundation whose designer and builder is God. It wasn't about a, an actual like dirt mountain, farmland, rivers, streams, all that different stuff, promised land. It was about realizing we live in a broken world and we long for the promised land. We long for heaven. We long for all things to be made new, for death to be no more, for every tear to be wiped away, for there to be no more sickness and no more pain and no more poverty and no more starvation and no more cancer and no more car wrecks and no more AIDS and all of those things gone. We look for those things. We long for those things. Suffering does that. Suffering is the will of God. Suffering produces in us things that only suffering can do. Suffering leaves that longing in our soul. It leaves us longing for the perfection, the rest of heaven. If you know the Lord Jesus, if you've repented of your sin and believed in Jesus, do not be too content in this world. We long to be restored in perfect fellowship with God and to walk with him. We, we long for that. If you're watching and listening right now and you don't know Christ, the Bible says you are a slave of sin. The Bible says you are dead in your trespasses and sins. That's how God sees you. But he loves you and he sent his only begotten son, the Bible says, Jesus, to die on the cross for your sin he rose from the dead and he offers to you freedom from your sin, your guilt, your shame, forgiveness of your sin and the hope of eternal life. The Bible says if you'll confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord, believe in your heart God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. That's the gospel message. If you're suffering today, I want you to know that I love you. My wife and I care so deeply for you. And I would never want to callously make light of your suffering. I just would want to encourage you to know that you do not suffer alone. God says to Jacob, I'll, I'll go down to Egypt with you. God, who sent his only, be son, only begotten son, became flesh. He lived among us. He knows loneliness. He knows suffering. He knows fear. He knows anxiety. He knows betrayal. He knows poverty. He knows hunger. He knows those things that we suffer. So when we go to God, he's fully aware of what we're feeling. So when we speak to him, he's someone that can not just sympathize, but someone who can empathize, Hebrews says. So I just want to encourage you with those words. Let's pray together. Jesus, thank you for your word. Thank you for just the truth of the scripture unfolding. God, I pray pray, I just pray that we would exalt you during this season. Trials that we face, God, we would realize it's your will and you're producing things in us that wouldn't be there otherwise. And God, it is a reminder the longing to be at home with you. As Paul says, Lord, to live is Christ, to die is great gain. So while we live in this broken, fallen world, Lord, we long to be at home with you. We embrace your sanctification in our lives. Mold us into the image of your son. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you soon.